Welcome to today's video on structs. First, a little bit of background. C allows us to define our own constants and type names so that our programs can more easily say what we mean. First, pound define allows us to define constants. In this case, we see that the number of terms has been defined as 3. Why constants, you might ask? The alternative would be to just use the number 3 directly in our source code. With these so-called magic numbers, it can be hard to figure out why the developer chose that number. What does that 3 mean when we see it? But when we read the name constant num terms, it is very clear. It's also easier to maintain our code in the future, since we only need to update the value in one place. Now note about the syntax, you'll notice that there's no semicolon at the end of the pound define statement. And that's because what's happening is before the program is even compiled, what's called a preprocessor goes through and substitutes 3 in place of everywhere it saw num terms. So you wouldn't want a 3 with a semicolon plugged in in place of num terms. Second, typedef allows us to give a new name to an existing type so that we can refer to it by a more meaningful name in the rest of the program. In this example, we're dealing with coins and we're defining coin value to be an integer. Then when we use it, we can declare quarter to be of type coin value and then give it a value that is indeed an integer. Notice that we have the same principle of clarity and maintainability here. If I wanted to update my code so that quarter were, say, 0.25, then I'd need to make it a float. And I would just need to change it in one place right in the type def. Notice the format, type def, and then a description of the old type, in this case an int, and then the new name that I want to use for it. With this in mind, think for a minute, how could we make our own Boolean type? So we see that we could define true to be 1, false to be 0, as we know. And then we could just use a type def to say that Boolean is just another name for an int. Now on to our main point, which are structs. Let's just say that the registrar wanted us to write a program to track information about students. What might he care about? Let's just consider three things in a simple example. The student's name, year of graduation, and GPA would want functions to display students, determine if they're on the honor roll, sort them alphabetically, and so on. We want to group all the information about a single student together rather than using separate variables. Note that an array wouldn't work, since in C, arrays can only contain data of the same type, so that a name, which is a string, and a year of graduation, which is an int, can't be stored together. And even if this did work, like in a Python list, it'd be error prone, since then you'd have to remember that position zero is the name, position 1 is the year of graduation, and so on. But that's just what a C struct is for. In C, a struct, short for structure, groups related data that may be of different types, heterogeneous data. C doesn't have classes like Python or Java do. Structs are like classes, but with no operations. Let's look at the syntax for declaring a struct. First, let's look at the struct itself. After the struct keyword, we have a list of fields or the members of the struct, each with their type, all grouped in curly braces. This says that each variable of this struct type has all these fields with the specified types. Now notice how we're using typedef. So we say typedef, and then give the whole type, the old name, which was, in this case, the whole struct, and then we can give it a new name that we can refer to later on, and make it much easier in our code. Back to our example of the student. We see here that we're defining a struct with three elements in it and then naming it student. Note a few things. Name is a string, which is an array of characters. C requires us to specify the size of the array. Note that we typically capitalize the name of structs, just like we do classes in other languages. And you'll note down at the bottom, this is how the struct is stored in memory. How would we initialize the struct? Well, there's a few different ways you could do it. The first, and maybe simplest way, is just to do one field at a time. So we declare student to be of type student, and then we give values to the name, the year, and the GPA. To get a value into a string, we need to do a copy. The library function string copy is used. We'll talk about that in a later video when we look at strings in depth. Notice in each case that we use the dot operator, as in Python or Java, to get at the fields. So we say, student.gpa is 3.78. Well, what if we had a lot of students to initialize? A better solution would be to use a function. 
So here we're declaring a function called make student that takes the three values that it needs, the name, year, and GPA, and is going to stick them in, into the struct. Let's look inside the function. We see that we declare a student struct. We fill it with all of the data, as we did before, and then we return it. So notice that this function returns a struct. C only allows us to return one thing from a function. Without structs, we'd be trying to return the three pieces of data individually, and that's impossible in C. For those of you familiar with Java, you'll note that this is very similar to a constructor. If we want to use that function, well, it's pretty easy. Here in this example, we're declaring two students, student one and student two. And then later on in our code, we can just say that student one gets the result of the make student function, which is going to be a struct with Bob's information put into it. Similarly, for student two with Crystal. Finally, here's a shortcut that we can use. It only works when we declare and then initialize the struct all on the same line. So while it works here to give Bob the information, this other code wouldn't work if we declared the student and then did some other things and then came back and tried to initialize the value of Bob. So handy shortcut, but it's not as general as writing our own function. Finally, let's look at an example use of a struct. So here we see a print student function, a function that will just print the information from a student. Notice that we pass a student in as a parameter, and that we can then, inside the function, format how the student is printed however we like. Using a function makes it so that students are always printed using a consistent format. To summarize, we've seen structs being used as the types of local variables, as parameters, and as the return values for functions. In other words, we've used struct types everywhere the built-in types are used. Until next time, I'm Matt.